everyone and welcome to The Abstract. Today I want to talk to you about Marc Jacobs' aesthetics and creative process because I will be doing a video next week about his spring-summer 2018 collection, so stay tuned for that. Um, and I thought I'd provide you with some sort of a backgrounder that would cover pretty much everything from um, defining life moments to passions, mentor, muses, obsessions, um, to basically anything that might have influenced his approach to design and creations. And um, my goal with this little exercise is to pinpoint a few reoccurring themes or elements that would constitute Marc Jacobs' artistic DNA. Um, and this is all in the hope that it will help us put his latest collection in context. Now I do want to preface this video and this entire channel by saying that this will be the starting point of each and every runway analysis that I do and that a whole video will be dedicated each and every time to this preliminary research. Um, after that, a complete video will be devoted to the runway review per se, and then a third segment will come in time uh, and will be dedicated to one pivotal element of said runway, but we'll, we'll have time to get into that into more details later. So without further ado, let's kick this thing off with our first ever designer DNA segment featuring Marc Jacobs. Now, as you may or may not know, Marc Jacobs is a New York fashion designer who made his first impression on the fashion world in 1984 with his end of studies project at Parsons, which consisted in a collection of colorful, oversized hand-knit sweaters with huge smiley faces and polka dots adorning them. Now, the reason why I think it's worth looking into these first designs besides the fact that they earned him such immediate industry claim that he reused them when designing for a sketchbook, is that right there and then it crystallized this image of Marc Jacobs as a fun, playful designer who was already skillfully pulling from pop culture to fuel his imagination as he was coming of age in the golden era of raves. The sweaters, which are said to not only draw from the emerging acid house movement, but to also reference the work of sweet artist Keith Haring and op art painter Bridget Riley, were the first visible signs of Marc Jacobs' almost visceral connection to contemporary art, uh, film, music, and culture in general, um, a connection that would fuel his uh, imaginations for years to come. Fast forward 30 years and you still find Marc Jacobs uh, dropping names of artists like Oliver Eliasson, uh, musicians like Run DMC, actresses like Faye Dunaway, um, fashion designers like Walter Albini, and even movie characters like Sylvia Fowler from The Women and Lydia from Beetlejuice. Now besides the pattern, the decision to go for handmade knits uh, was also an early indicator of another one of Marc Jacobs' mantras, which is comfort. Um, in an interview he gave uh, to New York Magazine in 2006, Marc Jacobs uh, acknowledged using the word comfort a lot, but then he went on to explain that he didn't necessarily mean it as in um, how comfortable something feels on the skin, for example, but rather uh, how comfortable the familiarity of something is, whether that be a sweater hand-knitted by your grandmother like he did in his first collection at Parsons, or a classic all-American skirt suit, for example. Now, speaking of all-American classics, you probably already know the sportswear label Perry Ellis, and you've perhaps heard of its creator, who was a leading figure in the preppy movement in the mid-70s to mid-80s. Well, it turns out Marc Jacobs didn't only knew him, he was actually a big fan, and he went as far as to crash a party when he was 16 uh, to meet his idol, uh, tell him that he was one of his favorite American designers, and that he wanted to follow in his footsteps. And sure enough, after designing two collections for Sketchbook and launching his own label, Marc Jacob joined the ranks of Preppy Perry Ellis in 1989, three years after the designer had passed away. So what is it exactly we're talking about when we use the word prep? Well, it's actually something that started as an anti-fashion worn by Ivy Leaguers, 
but became increasingly sought after in the 50s as more and more people had access to college education and new media before reaching full-blown mainstream status in the 80s. And while you may not have lived to see the 30s, the 50s, or even the 80s, you must have watched Clueless and Mean Girls and Gossip Girl and Riverdale, so you know what we're talking about here. We're talking polo shirts, cardigans, crew neck sweaters, ladylike twin sets, we're talking shift dresses, pinafore dresses, cute Peter Pan collars, um, tailored coats, uh, Mary Jane's and loafers for footwear, um, ankle socks and headbands in the accessory departments, and all of these are heavily used in Marc Jacobs' collection throughout the years, as you can see. Now, as I mentioned before, Marc Jacobs was hired at Perry Ellis in 1989, and that was with the mandate of dusting off the increasingly antiquated image of the brand. Um, and that was a mission he would arguably accomplish four years in uh, with his spring-summer 1993 collection, the Grunge collection, um, which was a bittersweet moment in his life that simultaneously made his career and got him fired. The reason why I feel it's important to talk about this show isn't because I think grunge is somehow deeply ingrained in Jacob's creative DNA. After all, he was never a part of the scene, and as outlandish as beanies and flannel shirts and Duck Martens were in the context of a Perry Ellis collection, he was hardly setting any trend there, with grunge having already gone mainstream by 1992. What is interesting, however, is what drew him to the grunge movement, and that is the less polished, more nonchalant notion of beauty that its young emissaries were going for. Marc Jacobs saw and admired the coolness of it all, and he will probably be remembered as one of those designers who, by forcing it onto the fashion elite, gave youth culture fashion credibility. So while you may have heard the a little preppy, a little grungy, a little couture formula to describe uh, Marc Jacobs' creative process, saying that grunge is part of his artistic DNA seems a little bit far-fetched to me. However, you could say that he has this near veneration for youth, and I don't mean that in a weird way at all, but there is this eagerness in Merck's work to echo the typecast sensibility, and that is very important to understand his work. So that leaves us with couture. Now, obviously, that is not to be taken literally as haute couture is a term regulated by law, uh, which requires, among other rigorous criteria, that fashion houses have an atelier in Paris, employing at least 15 people full-time. Um, but semantics aside, what the general perception of couture usually entails is, one, the use of the finest materials and fibers available, so you can think of the most luxurious furs, uh, silks, linens, the softest wools and cashmere. Um, two would be the use of gorgeous, exclusive fabrics. So we can think of charmeuse, satins, uh, plush velvets, brocades, damask. Um, and three, what would come to mind would be craftsmanship. And that is usually in the form of elaborate embellishment. So you can think of lace, sequin and feather work, um, hand beading, embroideries, etc. Now, those elements, with ruffles and sparkles being his favorite, um, became increasingly inherent to Marc Jacobs, especially since the early to mid-2000s, as people started rejecting the minimalistic approach of the 90s and started embracing this type of escapist glabber. Um, but also, as he gathered incredible knowledge from the ateliers of Louis Vuitton, uh, when he was appointed uh, creative director in 1997, and of course, uh, and very simply, as his own label transited from a cool indie label to a multi-million dollar powerhouse. So we've talked about Marc Jacobs' slavefulness and how in tune with culture he is, um, we've mentioned his yearning for comfort and how that makes him use the prep repertoire as a canvas for his creativity. Um, we've touched upon his soft spot uh, for youth, awkward yet transcending coolness. Um, and finally, we talked about couture as a way to elevate his creations. 
Now there is only one missing piece to the puzzle of Marc Jacobs' creative process, and that is, quite ironically, the idea of constant change. Um, as Tim Blanks once put it, the only thing certain in a Marc Jacobs show is that nothing is certain. And it is quite fascinating to follow his thought process from one season to the next, as surreal extravagance gives way to radical simplicity, um, as dark yields to light, and as psychedelic references follow gothic influences. It's what you could call the Marc Jacobs signature 180. All right, everyone, this ought to do it for our designer DNA segment featuring Mark Jacobs. Thank you so much for watching. Um, let me know what you thought. Did you agree? Did you disagree? Did you feel I missed something important? You can let me know in the comments below. Um, if you are interested in the subject that we touched upon today, I will leave a few uh, sources in the info box if you want some interesting reads. And if the whole thing was of interest to you, please give the video a thumbs up, subscribe and follow so you make sure you don't miss next week's video, which will be the Marc Jacobs Spring Summer 2018 Collection Review. Au revoir!